Ethical practitioners of early real estate realized they had problems, big problems in their industry all around them. What they didn't have was a viable way of solving them. They did recognize, however, that the problems were similar all over the country. And as the number of real estate practitioners grew, so did the need for collaboration among them if they were to address the issues facing their profession. It would take the leadership and vision of some of the largest real estate boards that existed at that time to come together to launch the organization that would eventually be known as the National Association of Realtors and create the Code of Ethics. This is the true story of how the Code of Ethics was created. Like the Constitution, some documents have survived the test of time because they're living documents or dynamic documents, which may be continually edited and updated. So it is with the Code of Ethics. It was created with vision, tested by social, political, economic, and legal challenges, and it survived. From the beginning, it was designed to be a realistic standard of performance. It has preserved its significance, relevance, and usefulness despite passing of years and changing times. Today, every realtor agrees to abide by the code of ethics with little thought to the history, so it's hard to understand how revolutionary it was when it was created. So we're going to have to go back in time to see just how remarkable the story of the code of ethics really was. The year was 1908 and it opened on a note of optimism with the first ever ball dropping in New York Times Square. First class stamps were only two cents, only 14% of homes had bathtubs, and only 8% of homes had telephones. Theodore Roosevelt was president. The American flag still had only 45 stars. There were no Mother's Day or Father's Day celebrations yet, and only 6% of Americans had graduated from high school. The tallest structure in the world was the Eiffel Tower. Most women only washed their hair once a month, and they used borax or egg yolks for shampoo. And the top leading causes of death were pneumonia and influenza. But electricity was about to improve the way of life for the country. Electricity was just beginning to be available in homes from about 1905 forward. Washing machines with motors were just introduced, as well as the first vacuum cleaning appliances. But it was Henry Ford's invention of the assembly line which made automobiles affordable for the middle class that was to have the most far-reaching impact on the nation and the real estate industry. Essentially a horse and buggy world up until then, America suddenly became a mobile society. Personally owned automobiles enabled people to travel across the country or across town. It was now possible for people to live away from the crowded cities. Because 100 years ago, most Americans didn't own their own homes, and the cities held the vast majority of the American population. There just weren't any other choices to live when most of the employment was in the city. So the crowded, dirty, dangerous environment was where the majority of population called home. 75% of Americans lived in rented apartments or flats. A majority of those renters lived in cellars or tenement dwellings with poor lighting and little or no ventilation. More decent housing was desperately needed. But the concept of the suburb hadn't even been born yet. But it was about this time, because of the affordable automobile, that many cities and towns were rapidly expanding. Owning a car meant not having to live in the city to work there. The concept of commuting to the city for employment and living outside the city in the suburbs was finally possible. And there were plenty of wide open spaces beyond the crowded cities just ready for development. But the rapid demand for the development of land brought on new challenges because transaction paperwork was getting more complicated. You see, from the colonial era through much of the 19th century, the buying and selling of real estate was a relatively simple process, with land usually sold at auction or given away by the government or passed on by families to the next generation. So there wasn't a lot of paperwork involved. But as huge parcels of land were subdivided into large tracts that were then divided into smaller parcels by investors and speculators, 
the transfer of land from one owner to another became more complex, creating a need for someone familiar with local real estate practices and available properties in the area. In cities where real estate activity was high, practitioners began to form local organizations as a means of sharing information about properties for sale and becoming acquainted with other practitioners who could be trusted, and there were many who could not be trusted. Enter the bad guys. 100 years ago, anyone, I mean anyone, could call themselves a real estate dealer. There were men called curbstoners. These unscrupulous individuals would basically set up shop as a real estate dealer on the sidewalk or curbstone and bilk or swindle anyone they could. Apart from misrepresentation, there was outright fraud and opportunities for fraud were rampant. Selling land they didn't hold title to with contracts of sale, buying worthless land, mortgaging it heavily with an accomplice, then selling the mortgage to an unsuspecting buyer, or selling the same first trust deed multiple times. These robber barons didn't need guns to achieve their purposes, they just used documents. We live in a world with RESPA. 100 years ago, there was little recourse if transactions went awry, so sellers were easy targets. Property had increased significantly over the generations, and second and third generation farmers were fatigued with the struggles of farming life and very willing to sell the land to speculators for subdivisions and tract homes, realizing they could purchase a motor car and find work in the city while still living in a modern home away from the city. They were vulnerable to unethical dealers that would impress them with a value for their property, low as it might be. It would still sound significant, and it frequently would be in a net listing arrangement for compensation, which meant the dealer would be compensated the amounts over the low value that was agreed with the seller. Buyers were equally at risk, as this was the error of phony subdivisions. It was cheap and easy to have a subdivision map drawn up on paper with several prime locations and then lure those with any money into believing they could own such a parcel to finally build a home of their own. They may have been shown an open lot close to a brook and shade trees. That was attractive to these city dwellers. Unfortunately, by the time they would realize the swindler dealer they had paid their life savings to either didn't have the authority to sell the property or had sold the same parcel multiple times or that the sellers' names had been forged on their deeds, it was just too late. The swindlers took what they could from a town, and then they'd be long gone before their illegal and nefarious deeds were found out. But middle-class city dwellers would browse through the Sears and Roebuck catalog and dream about the houses that they could build themselves affordably. The house plans were free if they bought their materials from Sears. These advertisements for new homes didn't include bathrooms in the plans, but there's a note that the plans could be arranged with a bathroom for an additional charge. The earliest mortgages weren't offered by banks, but by insurance companies, and they differed greatly from the mortgage or home loans that we're familiar with today. Most early mortgages were short-term, with some kind of balloon payment at the end of the term, or they were interest-only loans. As such, many people were perpetually in debt in a continuous cycle of refinancing their home purchase, which provided the opportunity for private notes to be sold and resold. And sometimes the same note was sold multiple times at the same time. Clever and unscrupulous individuals were not above forging deeds or having deeds signed over to them under false premises. Take one Peter Van Vlissingen, once considered one of Chicago's most prosperous and reputable businessmen, who was arrested for fraud. He had used a newfangled electric light bulb under a plate glass desktop to trace signatures of the owners, the recorder, the notary, even the number on the deed. Upon his arrest, in exchange for a speedy justice, which if you can believe only took a total of four hours for indictment, hearing, and sentencing, he confessed to swindling 25 people out of $700,000. That's over $17 million in today's money, all by selling fraudulent notes. Turns out he wanted speedy justice before it was known that he'd actually swindled about 100 people and he took them for over $2 million, which is valued at over $42 million in money today. This behavior was going on all over the country. Back in August of 1904, 
Visitors from around the world gathered in St. Louis for the World's Fair and the centennial of the Louisiana Purchase. Real estate practitioners from seven Midwestern boards met at the same time and ended up discussing their common issues. They developed relationships. They kept in contact by letter and agreed to meet in Duluth in 1907 to talk about forming a national exchange. This group of serious-minded men realized that fraudulent subdivisions, multiple first mortgages, the net listing, and many other get-rich-quick schemes were rampant in all parts of the country. The Duluth Exchange hosted the meeting and provided Model T cars for cruising around the city, which was the first time many of the participants had ever been in a motor car. A big topic of conversation was, how will motor cars affect the real estate business? Edward S. Judd, the president of the Chicago Board, made the statement that ultimately launched the National Association of Realtors. He said, there's something about the permanency and stability of land which should give like traits of character to the real estate man. He suggested meeting in Chicago the next year for the purpose of forming a national organization. Chicago was considered the most central location for the existing boards at that time. So it was that letters went out to the 45 known boards in the country to meet in Chicago. In May of 1908, Mr. Judd welcomed to his city the first national real estate convention at which the National Association of Real Estate Exchanges was organized. 19 local boards from 13 states and one thoroughly organized state association from California met together. The Chicago Tribune commented while the convention was still in session, real estate sharks are really in danger of extermination through the formation of this real estate organization. Those 120 men who came together there knew what they wanted. They attempted at that meeting only one thing, the organization of a permanent national association. They came as the official representatives of their hometown boards, expressly authorized to act. From the start, they had a remarkable unity of purpose, and the experience behind them had given them a clear understanding of how it must be achieved. The first meeting was all about organization and purpose. Committees were set up. A standing ethics committee was appointed to draft ethics recommendations. The board presidents were asked what goals the proposed organization should have. Their replies were first for standards in ethics and business practice, second for exchanging information and statistics on the real estate business, and for all involved to promote real estate ownership and development. Separating themselves from unethical sharks and curbstone brokers was a primary concern. The need for some licensing requirements was evident. The Milwaukee Board President made the comment that in the state of Wisconsin, it is easier to become a real estate man and handle thousands of dollars worth of property and money than to become a barber charging 10 cents for a shave. Unlike earlier attempts of nationalizing the industry, the organizers of this body included the machinery to keep the wheels turning in between national conventions. They employed a secretary, as association executives were known then, and he was given an office for association work. Dues were set at a dollar a year with a $50 new membership fee. Factoring for inflation, that would be $25 for annual dues and $1,250 in new membership fee. It would become standard rhetoric at association meetings to talk about the riffraff in the industry as the organizers worked to establish themselves as the standard bearers of the square deal. William W. Hannon from Milwaukee was elected the first president in 1909. Actually, there was another real first president that served through the 1908 organization year, but for reasons to be explained a bit later, you don't hear much about him. The first board was elected to govern the fledgling organization. Many of this group continued to serve as presidents of the association, but from the first, a clear foundation was laid for the priceless volunteer services to the association down through the years by its elected officers and committees. They said the consideration for services rendered the association by any and all officers or committee men should be the benefit derived from such membership in the association, and no compensation should be paid. 
the first publication of the National Association of Real Estate Exchanges, which began publication in 1910, was designed to keep contact with members between annual convention meetings. But as we know, it was still five years from the formation of the association and the presentation of the first Code of Ethics. Consider the frustrations of a committee from across the country that only met once a year and didn't have conference calls or even phones for that matter. No faxes, emails, or tweets to work in between. They had to rely on letters between 14 members to discuss any ideas or changes. But the members continued to meet every year in a new location. In 1911, Frank Craven, the chair of the Committee on Ethics, made the suggestion that they should start with the golden rule as they were formulating the code. It would be two more years before a code of ethics was produced and another year after that before the golden rule was made part of the code. At the 1912 convention, members were mourning the three members of the Winnipeg Exchange that perished in the sinking of the Titanic just two months earlier in April. The convention authorized its board of managers to cooperate with the United States authorities in various states to stop fraudulent land operations and to attack misleading advertisement by irresponsible parties throughout the country which was reflecting badly upon the real estate profession. The National Real Estate Journal was published and sent to all members in anxious anticipation of the 1913 convention in Winnipeg. At that time and up to the 1940s, the national organization included both the United States and Canadian members. This is the invitation that went out to all real estate men and their ladies. And a view of the exterior of the convention headquarters in Winnipeg. And the interior of the convention hall with delegates from both the United States and Canada. Finally, five years after the formation of the National Association of Real Estate Exchanges, the members assembled to adopt their long-awaited ethics of the real estate profession as it was originally called. President Charles Simpson, whose great-grandfather fired the first shot in the Revolutionary War, entertained the motion for adoption of the first Code of Ethics. A committee member stood and said, The motion is for the adoption of the rules for conduct and that they be taken as the Code of Ethics of the National Association. After unanimous consent, a delegate arose to say, Many important things have occurred here today, but none so important as the action we have just taken. And with the adoption of that motion, the shift from let the public be damned to let the public be served was complete. Paige Carter, the chair from Kansas that year, said in his convention speech that the code could never tell people specifically what to do in a given situation. The word ethics comes from the Greek word meaning character. So the code could only guide ethical real estate men to operate in keeping with their own character and their own sense of right. It was a single piece of paper printed on both sides and folded into thirds. There were 23 original articles, although they weren't referred to as articles for several years. The requirement to arbitrate commission disputes was included in the original version of the code. By the following year, the ongoing task of reviewing and refining the code was already underway. Two categories of ethical duties became three, with a new category, duties of the broker to the prospective buyer, being added. But no mention of arbitration of broker disputes, which had been in the original 1913 code. Two years later, as delegates met in Los Angeles for the 8th Annual Convention, there were more changes. That third edition, now called the Code of Ethics, was adopted in 1915 and gave each item the title of paragraph, a forerunner of the term article that we use today. It made suggestions to owners and investors and added a duty to organize. Arbitration requirements returned and the first mention to have ethical charges decided by local boards was added and the golden rule was moved to first position. The 1916 convention was important for two reasons in NAR history. First, the members adopted their new name, the National Association of Real Estate Boards, which remained the name until the early 1970s when the name changed to the current National Association of Realtors. And more importantly, the term Realtor was adopted to signify a real estate dealer that was a member of the national organization 
and who is committed to upholding the code of ethics. Charles Chadbourne, Vice President of the National Association of Real Estate Boards and the former President of Minneapolis Board, was actually the originator of the term Realtor. Recounting the tale of how he came up with the term, Chadbourne explained that the idea came to him in 1915 after seeing a news headline that read, Real Estate Man Swindles a Poor Widow. Recently discovered information is that the real estate man referred to in the headline was not an obscure speculator at all, but it was August H. Frederick who served out the first organizing year in 1908 as the first president of the National Association. However, due to the disgrace he brought upon the association after his conviction of swindling a poor widow in 1915, Frederick's name was virtually expunged from official records. The downfall of Frederick was reported prominently in newspapers across the country because he was a well-known businessman having served the National Association. He was an active church official and an aspiring politician who had just been elected president of the St. Louis Board of Aldermen the day before his arrest. On March 27, 1916, the Executive Committee passed Chadbourne's resolution establishing Realtor to mean a member of the association. He sold the rights to the word for one dollar. And for the rest of his long life, Chadbourne was known as Father Realtor. Chadbourne wrote in an article in 1922, the word Realtor signifies more than merely board and national association membership. The true Realtor is a man of high ideals. He has made the code of ethics of the National Association a part of his personal code of honor. He would rather lose a record-breaking commission than violate his own conscience. That same article in the Saturday Evening Post went on regarding the term Realtor that there was a nationwide movement in full swing for the betterment of American business and for the framing and enforcing of an ethical code that will ensure correct standards and fair dealing. The real estate men have hit upon an exceedingly clever and ingenious device to assist them in the achievement of their aims. We'll end our history of the code with the fourth edition of the code adopted in 1924 when the preamble that included the golden rule was added. The 1924 code now called each item an article as we do today. It also added suggestions to the public that defined the terms client and customer and incorporated Article 4 from the National Bylaws requiring every member board to adopt the code. The 14 members of the Ethics Committee wrote the preamble together at the Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C. a few days before NAR's annual convention began there in early June. The preamble appeared in their first draft of the new code and remained basically unchanged except for one minor edit. The committee chair, A. H. Barnhissel, later wrote that it was based on the preamble of the U.S. Constitution. It reads in part, The realtor is the instrumentality through which the land resources of the nation reaches its highest use and through which land ownership attains its widest distribution. He is a creator of homes, a builder of cities, a developer of productive farms. Such functions impose obligations beyond those of ordinary commerce. They impose grave social responsibility and a patriotic duty to which the realtor should dedicate himself and for which he should be diligent in preparing himself. In 1955, the language of the preamble was modernized, but realtors were unhappy with the changes, and in 1961, members reverted to the earlier language because of its superior phrasing. No further attempts were made to alter the preamble until 1994. All told, the code has been amended 37 times. Realtors serving on the Professional Standards Committee have labored to ensure that the code is a living document that protects the sellers, buyers, landlords, tenants, and others who place their trust in Realtors, and that the code's obligations are phrased in clear, objective, and unambiguous terms, and that the code remains relevant and meaningful in the constantly changing real estate environment. The goal today, as it was in 1913, is to ensure consumers a square deal when working with a Realtor. And thus the code was born, and it has served since 1913 as a golden thread 
binding realtors together in a common continuing quest for professionalism through the ethical obligations premised upon moral integrity and competent service to clients and customers and dedication to the public interest and welfare. The code has been amended many times to reflect changes in the real estate marketplace, the needs of property owners, and the perceptions and values of society. But its demand for high standards of professional conduct, protecting the interests of clients and customers, and safeguarding the rights of consumers of real estate services has not and will never change. Mm -hmm.